Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the audience who are still patient to, to be supportive <laughs> to the last minute. So uh, it's also a technology presentation this time, and I will be trying to talk about the NEMS FTIR spectrometer for environmental monitoring. We have been talking all over those two days on the uh, CO2 absorptions, uh, the control of CO2 absorption, and so on. I think one of the most important areas to have is to have a, a, a monitoring system, an efficient monitoring system that allows us to monitor the CO2 emissions from different devices, from different cities, from diff in different locations, and so on. And it's not only for, for environmental and for greenhouse, it's not only CO2 also, it's CO2, it's CO, it's also other uh, gases, it's also volatile organic materials, volatile organic components, which is very important in, from an environmental point of view. So this is actually the objective of our talk, was how to develop a gas analyzer systems, which is not really a benchtop gas analyzers, but in the, order, in the form of a sensor, a small sensor, which is low cost sensors. Uh, and it can be implemented everywhere in the cities and can be used for direct monitoring of all the emission and absorption to be able to satisfy the 1.5 CO2 objective. So I'll, I'll try to, to go quickly in the presentation because we have only 10 minutes, unfortunately. Uh, you, the most, I the think most you, can, you can go five, five minutes over, it's okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the most, the most important uh, and critical issue in this uh, CO2 sensor is the, the low cost and the small size and simple and, uh, operations. Uh, no maintenance for such, such system is also an essential to be able to, to implement it everywhere. What are the, the existing technologies? There's a lot of techniques. Uh, the most common is the chemical sensors, of course, but chemical sensors, while they are low cost, but they are suffering from saturation and replacement and maintenance and so on. And usually chemical sensors are used per gas, so each gas has its, its own chemical sensor. Similarly for the CO2, CO2 uh, uh, CMOS sensor, CMOS, CMOS sensors can be used for, for, for gas sensing also, but usually when you have a C most sensors, you can identify how much gas, but you cannot identify the gas, the gas itself, which gas you have. And you have different gases that are different in nature in our applications. Uh, we know from gas sensing analysis that the optical techniques are the best techniques. Uh, the, we can identify, quantify the, uh, the, the amount of gases existing uh, very correctly through the fingerprint of the gas itself and the absorption of the fingerprint. But the problem is that this Optical techniques, these Fourier transform spectroscopy techniques are usually bulky and expensive. This is the main problem in this. So they are quite suitable for usage in the labs, but it's not easy to use them as a monitoring element. And this is the object of our research, actually. So we try to mix these two types of technologies, the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy techniques, which is very well known, established for laboratory measurements, and the MEMS technology, which allows to have the integrations, the scalability, the reliability, and the scalability is very important, of course, because it will lead to the reduction in, in the price. When you increase the number of elements, the number of sources, it will reduce the cost greatly, exactly like what we have in the mobile phones. So, so our objective actually is to have a spectrometer per mobile phone, as we have now a camera per mobile phone or two cameras per mobile phone, we can have easily also one or two spectrometers per mobile phone. If you have this objective, we can use this for gas monitoring everywhere and for many other applications. So we, stru we started this development a long time ago, about 10 years, in cooperation between Einstein University, from which I'm coming, Ecolisier in Paris for the technology developments and the small company, Egyptian company, Cyware Systems Company, in which I'm also CTO for the developments. And this is the, the overall uh, result of the cooperations. The idea is quite simple. An FTIR spectrometer is simply a beam splitter with two mirrors, one moving mirror and one fixed mirrors, and mixing the two signals from the back from the fixed mirror and the moving mirror, you actually get some autocorrelation functions. When you, when you do the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function, you can get the spectrum. And you can build this on a MEMS substrate or a MEMS wafer or a MEMS die simply by having the silicon interface itself at the beam splitters and you have a moving mirrors and a fixed mirror 
by metallization on one side, and the moving mirror would be connected to a combi drive actuator, which is now classical in MIMS. The main challenge in such system is that, in addition, of course, to the building of the beam splitter here, or the throughput of the system itself, because if you fabricate, if you would like to fabricate all the component integrated on one step on a substrate to, to achieve the lower cost, you will be limited by the optical throughput of this fiber. So what we have done is that we spent a lot of time in the development of the technology itself, such that we can have a high throughput optical systems. And for this reason, we, we used the DBRACT in iron etching technology. Uh, the DBRACT fine etching technology is now very well known. You start by graving the silicon uh, from the surface, and then you, you make some protection and etching, protection and etching, and so on. After that, you get a surface like this, which is not an optical surface, of course. It's a bad optical surface. It has some scallops, and these scallops are not good to get a, a, a good mirror. But with some smoothing techniques, we have so, so different smoothing techniques we have developed for this purpose. And with this smoothing technique, you can transform this into an optical surface. And this is the magic of this technology. Because if this, vert is this vertical surface, the surface you have graved in silicon, is currently your optical surface. So you will be able to have mirrors, lenses, and all these components successively on the wafer. And the light will be going parallel to the wafer. And, and like that, you can get the light going from one component to another component. So it's not a surface micro machining mirror in which the light is going out of the surface. It's a, uh, a system in which the, the mirror is vertical to the wafer of the surface itself. And the light will be going in these directions. After that, it would be quite easy to, to have successive elements on the same wafer. So you can, you can build a complete system. Here is a max and interferometer, a complete max and interferometer in which the light is coming from these directions. This is the beam splitter, two mirrors, another beam splitter, and you collect the light on the output. And you have another output, even a complementary output also. Because this, the light is still propagating parallel to the wafer, so you can recollect it again and pass it by another optical element, by another filter, and so on. Here we can show some Bragg mirrors, for example, some corner tube reflectors, some uh, curved mirror to use it as a scanners. So you can create a lot of optical elements by this technique. And these, all these optical elements could be successively built on, on the single wafers with the scalability of the MEMS technology, which is quite like the IC technology. So you can estimate to have a very low price. Using this technology, we transfer what we have on optical table, an optical setup, into a die on the chip. And this die will be part of hundreds of dies, 400, 500 dies on a chip, which means that you will have 400 spectrometer on a chip, 500 spectrometer per chip, see, uh, per wafer, sorry. And then if you have uh, 10 wafers, 20 wafers, you can multiply the number of spectrometers generated and fabricated easily with very low cost. This is exactly what we have done. The rest is a free transform. And this is quite easy because you can do it using the electronic uh, systems for uh, signal analysis and data processing and so on. So the integration of the electronic is easy done. Here we have the integration also on the optical side. With the two chip solution, you can create your own spectrometers. We started this spectrometer, and the first version of this spectrometer has been done. It has the size of a credit card. This is the credit card size, actually, with the thickness in the order of one centimeters. And it was successful for all what we call an industrial IoT applications. And by industrial IoT applications, for example, if you, can use, if you, you would like to use it for soil analysis, which is one of the applications used in currently, you put it in a soil analyzer, you test the soil, you send the data by the mobile phones, and you tear uh, another data. You can use it in the, uh, uh, fab, uh, in, in the fabrication, in the market, uh, sorry, in the factory, that's what I see, to, to measure the exhaust, some things like that. But it's still a little bit larger in size to be implemented in a mobile phone or to be used as a sensor in the exhaust of cars and so on. So we made another version. This version has been developed with 
uh, optical connectors for the optical fiber input output and so on. So in a smaller version, which is only a few centimeters by few centimeters, and that integrates also the light the light source with it. So we have in this version two light sources integrated with the interferometers and all the electronics beside. And this shrinking in the size is due to the fact that instead of using optical guides to get the light input and output, we used another chip for the optical guiding, and this chip is using the reflections of the light. So it's like an, an optical mold that will be put over our MEMS technology, and with these two chip solutions, you have the complete spectrometers with the optical in output guiding also. Now, this spectrometer can be used in many uh, applications in the wearable domain, in the mobile phone, and so on. And it can be used definitely for something like the gas sensors. It got a lot of international recognition prizes in the Aftonic Rest Conference, in the technology showcase, and so on. And now we start examining the gases. How can we measure the gases with these spectrometers? So each gas has its own fingerprint, as we know. And this fingerprint is some absorption lines in the uh, wavelength domain. The problem is that if you would like to measure these individual lines, you need a very high resolution spectrometer. And this is quite tough to be done, at least for the current version, because the separation here is few picometers or things like that. But you still have the envelope of this uh, fingerprint solution, which is also a fingerprint of the gases, actually. And this, this envelope is a, a good indication of the rotational and vibrational transitions. You have two mechanisms that call this, this envelope. And for all the gases, you will have always this type of two envelopes and small lines inside. So we made some study, some analytical study also to show is possible through the envelope, so if you have a lower resolution spectrometer, is it possible to identify the gases also? And we found that it, this is possible with the aid of some machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. What you will have actually with lower resolution is that you will have smaller depth. This is an example of what you get with 0.1 centimeter minus one spectrometer and what you get with 60 centimeter minus one spectrometer. So you have, you have only lower depth in the absorption so, and based on some lines like that, you can identify what is the resolution you are in need of to be able to identify the gas and to quantify the amount of the gas. And we confirmed this study of the gas analysis by using some measurements with different techniques, either with tunable lasers source, which allows to have very narrow line resolutions, optical spectrum analyzer with a little bit wider resolutions, and at lower depth, actually, but we still can observe this, and, and even a spectrometer with a relatively wide resolutions. Based on that, we identified the required resolutions, and then we started doing the measurements with the resolutions we have, and also we started the measurements on some steps. So we started by standard gas cell, a 10 centimeter gas cell with the standard gases, and we try to identify these gases. It's possible to measure them with low resolution spectrometers, and that's uh, what we get when we compare the measurements with 66 centimeter minus one and 33 centimeter minus one, for example, for different gases. So we can identify the CO, the CO2, the CH4, the H2S, and so on. So different gases that can uh, affect the pollutions we have. And after that, we start doing the measurements over in, in, in open air environment, actually. So in this case, you will have all the spectrum and spectrum variations. And you can observe the CO2 at this range of wavelengths easily. Uh, uh, other materials uh, which are different from gas, uh, like uh, volatile organic components, which are dangerous, actually cannot be measured in, in a free space like that, has been also tested using a standard gas cell with 50 centimeters uh, uh, length and an, an equivalent 20 meters optical length inside and can be easily also identified using uh, the same uh, techniques. And, and here we can see some comparison between 
uh, the results obtained by a bench top spectrometers and the result obtained by a miniaturized spectrometer. The miniaturized spectrometer, we can see that uh, the major spectrum is very close from between, between them and the slight differences can be easily uh, evaluated uh, or, or overcome using the artificial intelligence techniques actually. So I'm not going more beyond that brain. Uh, I'll jump to the conclusion is that uh, the use of MEMS technology can allow actually to have an FTIR to transform the FTIR spectrometer from a bench top uh, instruments to uh, a sensor, a real sensor with very small dimension. dimension. It can be used for measuring multiple gathers without the need to have a, a big uh, a close maintenance to your sensors without need to replace the sensor because it's not saturated by the gas. It allows to measure the multiple gases simultaneously at the same time. Uh, it can be used in the energy domain, specifically for the greenhouse solutions, the hydrocarbons analysis, and so on. And finally, I would like to thank you and thank all the donors who support us in this research. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes. Uh, which is my resolution is being able to measure something in terms of, say, a biogas generator that you wanted to be able to change the air to fuel ratio quickly and cost effectively? Um, I'm not expert in the biogas, but you can measure the methane, for example, which is in yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the, uh, actually, one of the applications for this is to use it for the evaluation of the energy contents of the gases generated in the, in the biogas generators. Because if you would like to integrate this biogas, bi biomass, so biogas generators, in the network, you should be able to identify exactly how much energy inside. Because they are, they are different in nature. It depends on the generators and the feed of the generator itself. So uh, they, say, they will say that we are generating methane, but it's not all methane, or they are not all butane. Yes, you, should have, you will have different components. And you need to know what's exactly the different components inside, uh, what the energy of the different components inside. The energy is, is the most important parameters. Well, actually, I just want to save people who are dying in hospitals. Yeah, so that's actually. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah. This, this is another important yeah, application, of course. <laughs> so it can be used for that. Also. Okay, last chance. For, yeah, one more. Now, it's still not a calibration. Does it need calibration? It has some self calibration, but if, if you are talking about calibration, because in, in FTIR spectroscopy, you have uh, different uh, mean for the calibrations. So there is, of course, a calibration that is done on the factory at the beginning. But usually in spectroscopic analysis, you need also continuous calibrations. And this continuous calibration is done by, using, by measuring a background. So the technique in, in the system such that you measure a, big, a background, and then you measure the, the, the gas with the system. And the background is taken, well, this is a little bit an IB which is, has not been yet announced, but you have some sort of the, uh, of the light used as a background in the system which is not exposed to uh, to the environment where the gas is. And you use this as a background for each measurement. And like that, you have uh, a self-calibration mechanism. So you make the calibration each measurement, actually. That's what we are, we are using. All right, great. Thanks, everyone, for staying until the very end of the session and conference. Let's thank all the speakers once more. Thank you.